Uh, I'm Gary Bershears. I teach at Western Seminary in Portland. And we also have campuses in uh, San Jose and Sacramento and a teaching site in Seattle and a powerful online presence. And we are without a doubt the best seminary in the entire world. There's no other good one anywhere because it's ridiculous. Ah! Uh, no, Western Seminary is a good seminary. And uh, it's, uh, the, the thing we do is train pastors of all different varieties for pastoral ministry. That's the heart of what we do. I've got some brochures up here. The handouts are right here. And they're floating around. Do you have an extra pen? I'll come up here in a second. Okay. Uh, the, uh, we got it here. Uh, what I need, the thing I want to do in the workshop here uh, is very interactive. There will be lots of time for lots of place to interrupt with questions. I'm, I'm fine with questions. Uh, and, uh, you know, so ask, keep your hand up. I'll ask you some questions. It'll be fun to see. I, and what I want to think about is this current place where uh, the Supreme Court has said that, uh, that marriage uh, is open to two men or two women. And of course, very soon, that will be further open to uh, what we call polygamy, or polyandry, or polyamory. We will have in the fairly near future, uh, we'll have two men married to three women type stuff. We'll be fully legal and recognized. I mean, that, that's not even a question. That's, that's just a, it, it's coming. So a lot of people say, oh my gosh, we're gonna have polygamy. Uh, it's, already, it's already happening. And not just Mormons. Uh, there are a number of women who would rather have half a man than no man. <laughs> and they're gonna sign up for polygamy. And uh, it's going to go badly. Uh, welcome to the world. But what I want to do is think about what does sexuality look like? Really, the only reason to say an equal marriage environment is because that's the issue that's been thrown on the table. And I am of the opinion that a lot of Christians are responding, or I should say reacting, very wrongly in how they're doing it. And they're actually tarnishing the name of Jesus because of the way they're responding. Uh, and the key thing here is what Jeremy was talking about this morning. And his first thing, what was his first C? What was Jeremy's first C this morning? Compassion, Compassion not what? Combating. Com respond with compassion, not combative. And what's happening in many cases is Christians, because of the moral judgment that same-sex marriage is wrong, and I share that, uh, are responding combatively and not compassionately. So I think that's a foundation. So what I want to do here is define uh, sexuality. This is Genesis 1. What does God do in Genesis 1, 27? He makes man in his image and what? There are handouts over here. I'd be glad for you guys to have them. Mm -hmm. Somebody over there wants to take the responsibility to make sure people get those as they come in. What does God do? What's the last phrase of verse 27? Male and female. So we see that male and female are creation categories, and they're there all the way along. There's a handout over there. So male and female is there. What's the first command to come out of that image bearer? Be fruitful. Be fruitful multiply. How do you do that? And don't get graphic. <laughs> How do you do that? Populate. By having sexual intercourse. Uh, so that's a good thing. Genesis 2.18. It's not good for man to be alone. That doesn't mean not good here. Doesn't, is not a moral category. Good is not, in the Genesis 1, is not fundamentally a moral category. And God looked and said, it is good. That's a functional category. It'll get the job done. He says that for uh, a man to be alone is not good. How come? You can't fulfill his function. You can't be fruitful <coughs> with just a guy. You need a woman. Can we subdue and rule the world with just a guy? Nope. I'd argue we can't. We need 
male and female, to do those things come right out of it. So he'll make a suitable helper. And what is a suitable helper? It's a dog, of course. Right? A dog is a suitable helper. Why, how much of our society is saying, forget the woman, let's get a dog. Dogs are way easier to get along with than wives. And uh, that's really unfortunate, because the Lord made a woman, brought her the man, the man said, this is bone and bone, flesh my flesh, what's that saying? She's a part of me. She's like me. But she's different, how so? How is she different? This is not hard yet. She's a woman, and it's not just anatomy. Some of the crazy stuff, I mean, just fun, crazy is the amount of work that's being done to say that male and female are interchangeable in our society. Gender malleability is a way bigger issue than equal marriage. That men can become women and women can become men, and it's just like that, uh, is, I mean, it's just amazing. And anything a man can do, a woman can do, and vice versa, the simple answer is that's not true. Uh, the women into our society. And he says this, and leaves his father and mother, and his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, meaning what? Naked. Doesn't mean no clothes, so that's true. What does naked mean? Completely vulnerable. The deepest part of who I am is open. The opposite of naked is defensive and hiding. Vulnerable, and they felt no shame. And remember, this is not just Adam and Eve here. How do I know this is not just Adam and Eve? <coughs> How do I know this is not just Adam and Eve? Yeah, Adam didn't have a daddy. This is a command for all drawing out of the creation pattern. So a man will leave his father and mother. Actually, like Peter Paul, well, Paul, Peter Paul and Mary wrote the marriage song. And yet, in a woman, she'll leave her home. It's not in Genesis, uh, but it's in the culture. And make it felt in shame. And what's that saying to me, as a sinful man, is the goal of marriage is where I can be completely vulnerable to Sherry and not feel shame even about my shameful stuff because of the depth and intimacy and safety of our relationship. So Sherry and I have been practicing marriage for 47 plus years. And I still have not gotten it all correct. You can check with Sherry and see <laughs> Okay, so definition of marriage. This is on your handout. If you don't have a handout, stick your hand up and somebody will get you one. Got them? Okay. So this is a standard definition of marriage. We need one handout right over here. Somebody can pass it over. The publicly pledged permanent exclusive covenant union of one man and one woman. That's what marriage is. Now, wedding customs vary dramatically across cultures, but all cultures have a wedding. It's permanent. It's a, a past the realm. There's some back on it. It's now too. And it's one man, one woman. Where did we get this? Genesis. Genesis. Okay. Now, what did Jesus say about marriage? This is the basic patterns of marriage in the Surah Dhamma. Great family, great mission, great friendship, great passion. What did Jesus say about marriage? Did he define marriage? That's a trick question. Did Jesus define marriage? Yes. No. Why do you say no? Because he affirmed a definition that was already there. Jesus affirmed a pre-existing definition of marriage. So what's the first thing Jesus quotes? in his definition of marriage here in Matthew 19. Genesis what? Genesis 1, 26, which is what? Male and female. And then he affirms, what's the second thing he affirms? Genesis 2, 24, 25. And he puts those two verses together, affirming them, and then he adds on something else, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So he actually goes beyond something that's implicit in the original definition. Does Jesus define marriage? Yeah, absolutely. 
Now, just for curiosity's sake, how many of you know who Matthew Vines is? Matthew Vines, hand. Okay. Any of you know? I haven't read his book, but I just need to watch a lot of books. Yeah, Matthew Vines is a gay Christian. Uh, he did a video a couple of years ago that's on YouTube. It's, I don't know how many million views it's had. Uh, but he is arguing as a professed evangelical, Harvard, who left Harvard to do this mission, kind of like Bill Gates left Harvard to do something called Microsoft. Mm -hmm. uh, and his mission is to educate the church as to why our definition, our anti-gay marriage is not biblical. He is saying that the traditional view of marriage, that I would have and probably most of you would too, is not biblical and proceeds to do it with great insight. His book, God and Gay Christian, just came out recently and it goes into more detail. He is a leading spokesman as an evangelical Christian for gay marriage. And he's very resourceful and very, very, very bright and excellent debate. And what he's saying is this and much other than that. Here's the question. What does Jesus say about homosexuality? What does Jesus say about homosexuality? Leviticus says it's an abomination. Leviticus 20 says it. What did Jesus say about homosexuality? Nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. So if Jesus is okay with homosexuality, why are you so torqued out about it? Jesus said absolutely zero, the argument goes, about homosexuality. Why are you torqued out? Now, that's the answer. Or that's the question. Here's the response. What did Jesus say about rape? What did Jesus say about rape? Nothing. Zero. Nada. What did Jesus say about sex trafficking? Pimps going out and getting lonely 15-year-old girls and prostituting them. What did Jesus say about sex trafficking? Nothing. So apparently, Jesus is okay with gay sex, rape, and sex trafficking. See, that's the way to respond to the argument. Did Jesus talk about homosexuality? And the answer by specific term, no. Did Jesus define marriage? Yes. How did he define it? One man, one woman, husband and wife for life. Now, here's the rest of the story. Matthew 15, Jesus talked about things that are defiling. When he talks about defiling things, where does he start? Evil thoughts. Actually, not the mouth, but the brain. Mind. Evil thoughts. And what else? Murder. Adultery. Sexual immorality. Theft. False testimony. Slander. Now, sexual immorality is the Greek word, pernea, which means what? What's the English word we get from that? Pornography. What does pernea mean? Any Greekers in here? Got your Strong's out on your phone yet? Blue letter Bible? It, pernea just means any sexual activity outside of marriage. Any, any, any sexual activity outside of marriage. Did Jesus speak to homosexuality? Yeah. Not directly, but categorically he did. Did Jesus speak to rape? Yes. Not specifically, but categorically. Did Jesus speak to sex trafficking? Yes. Did Jesus speak to pornography? Yes. Not specifically, but categorically. How did you do that? By saying pornea, any sexual activity outside of marriage, is defiling. So the argument Jesus does not speak to homosexuality is simply not true. As long as you accept that categorical, if he's going to mention it specifically, then he's okay with rape. And nobody thinks Jesus is okay with rape. So that's the way to approach that particular question. Where does sexuality come in the list here? Gary, if I can stop you just for a second. Stop. 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 
would would the gay culture then come back and say, well, that's why we need to get married? They would. I mean, that seems would. like that line of briefing. And what would you do with that line of argument? Just jump back to me. Go back one to one, one. Matthew 19. Okay, good. See, Jesus unequivocally defines marriage as a man and a woman. And copy, doesn't define it himself, he affirms the Genesis definition. So marriage is one man, one woman, and anything outside of marriage is pornea and defiled. So he's speaking categorically. Now that will not satisfy Matthew Vines, I quickly promise you that. But if somebody's, and I'm thinking more towards church people here, my approach to gay folk when I talk to them on these kinds of issues, I do similar things, but I don't assume the authority of Scripture in the same way. Scripture is a covenant document between a loving and redemptive God who is at work redeeming us. It's not a book of rules applied abstractly to humans in general. And that definition of Scripture is really important. So, what is his motivation for wanting to justify this I mean, why is he so passionate about trying to convince people to change what has been historically true? Why would he just not leave Christianity? Just okay, why does Matthew Vines not just leave Christianity? Of course, many have. Uh, Matthew Vines, I've never spoken to him. I have friends who know him fairly well. And what they tell me is that Matthew Vines sincerely believes that uh, marriage between two men is a brand new thing. And had Paul and Jesus known about that, they would say, oh yeah, that went okay. And his argument, broader argument, is that the so-called traditional teaching on homosexuality is actually an imposition from reason. And that's what's in his book. I disagree with him, but he's profound in his argument. So he is, is he trying to justify his own stuff? Well, he's not married, and he's celibate. He hopes to be married because he believes that is a God-blessed status, and he would affirm strongly that sexuality outside of marriage would be sin. Again, that's what I hear him. I've never heard him say that, but friends say he would stand there strongly. So he's arguing for marriage, but broadening that to include a category that the biblical writers simply didn't know about. And we've got lots of areas where the Bible uh, doesn't speak to things we can now do today, so we extend scripture to new items. And that's his argument. And I disagree with him, but that's the kind of argument he's doing. I'd argue the concept that they didn't know about it. I, this this is a place where Vines has really done his homework. Uh, he has he has a very good memory, and he can quote documents from the ancient world off the top of his head, just like that. And I have a website, Brashears.net, and on that's my last name .net, and on that website there's a page over on the right side, it says Roundup Resources. And in that page is a whole list of resources that I would commend to you. And among my resources, one of the things that I commend is William Loder, L-O-A-D-E-R. He's an Aussie. He is a gay Christian, a liberal Anglican, very liberal Anglican, but he's an ordained priest in the Anglican Church. Uh, and he is an expert in first century sexuality. He's written like five fat books on it. And he's then he wrote a shorter book in the Bible on homosexuality. And he argues that the Bible is against homosexuality and it's wrong. And I think he's right. Except that the Bible's not wrong, it's right. Here's a guy with no axe to grind and he takes, he says, of course the Bible's anti-homosexuality. And it's wrong. Okay, so the Bible's wrong there, it's right and many others. Uh, Vines is trying to argue that the Bible doesn't address gay marriage specifically, but would have been okay. I'm much more with William Loder, who I think is more honest than, and remember, remember, gay marriage is not the issue. It simply is not the issue. If I go back to 35, 40 years to the abortion debates, what led the fight when you're being, oh, abortion is okay? What was the lead in the fight? Women's rights. No. Rape. Okay. A woman who's raped and pregnant. Are you saying that woman must carry the 
the baby inside her that came out of this horrific sin. She's already been hurt so badly by the rape that you want to increase the hurt? Oh my gosh. And what do I all say? Man, that is gnarly. I hope you have compassion for that woman. Now, I don't think killing the baby is the solution. But that's going to that's gonna tweak any of our conscience. I work with a woman who had that very thing happen. And I huge compassion for her. That's not the issue. You know, how many raped women get abortions? I mean, how many, how many abortions are raped, raped women? <coughs> tiny, tiny percentage. But see, I was lead with that. And we're suckered off into dealing with raped women when the abortion issue really is 14-year-old girls who are pregnant by 28-year-old men who don't want an inconvenient baby around them. That's the issue. Gay marriage is simply not the issue. Gay people are not getting married yet. I mean, there are some, but that's not the issue. Gay, the thing is, do you approve of that and then therefore lots of other gay sexuality, which comes down to where the real issue is, 15-year-old kids doing sexual classes in the schools and in other places are going to be said, you need to decide who you are, you need to decide your gender for yourself, and you need to decide your sexual preference for yourself. Do not let anybody tell you what you should be. You need to experiment with everything and figure out who and what you are. That's the issue. And there cannot be any right or wrong in that you need to decide for yourself in a completely neutral environment. That's the issue. The marriage is just the right case to lead that bigger issue. So remember the issue. So, yeah. Can I ask a question? No. <laughs> Look at him. Look at him disobeying. Look at him disobeying. <laughs> You're joking. I am. It's been my dialogue that compassion is the issue here. It my is. dialogue with homosexuals or advocates of gay marriage is that you're judging and you're showing no compassion. That's their, their trump card. Yep. You know, this might come later to really get into a serious conversation or somebody who's truly interested in scripture, but it's always that you're judging, yep. stop it, and, and then you're not loving. Right. You're against the law. And unfortunately, that too often is true. Well, and the narrative of the culture is making it always true. Well, being against it at all is an act of judgment or a lack yeah. of compassion. I'm against lots of things that I hope people would see me being compassionate toward. It's called sin. I hope sinners would find me to be compassionate when I sit down and talk to them about what's going on and help them get out of it if they went out. Unfortunately, a lot of people sell their sin. They love their. They despise the light because their deeds are evil, John 3.19 says. And that's going to be true here as well, but we can still do that. Okay. Does the Bible believe in good sex? Careful. Does the Bible believe in good sex? You have to define what good sex is. This is critical. Is your definition of sex. So a handout. Fill in the blanks if you want to do it. If this is two possibilities for definition of good sex. A pleasurable whole person bonding activity between husband and wife to express, confirm, and deepen their marital relationship. That's definition A. Pleasurable whole person bonding activity between a husband and a wife to express, confirm, and deepen their marital relationship. That's definition A. Definition B. A pleasurable recreational activity between consenting adults. That's two different definitions. By the way, this PowerPoint is at brashears.net roundup resources. You're welcome to take pictures, there's no problem with that. Yeah, you're very welcome to take pictures. This is all freely distributable. Which one is what are you going to affirm as a Bible Bible, Bible believer? Now here's what happens. Here's what happens. What does our culture support? Me. And here's what happens way too often. Christians de facto don't buy B and say only between a husband and wife. Did you repeat that? What Christians do is they don't realize that when we talk about good sex, that we bought definition B. And then you say, well, only between husband and wife. 
And the whole society says, how come? I mean, we love each other, why not? And we say it's a whole person, or it's a pleasurable recreational activity between consulting adults, if they're married. People say like, you're, you're a narrow-minded, bigoted, judgment, little whatever. We've got to go back to definition A. Good sex is a pleasurable whole person. It's not just a genital exercise. Mm -hmm. It's not just a biological climax. It's not just physically orgasmic, though it is those. It's a whole person bonding activity between a husband and wife to express, confirm, and deepen their marital relationship. Now sex does not bear the burden of being the idol in your life. It is a means of accomplishing a God-blessed activity called marriage. We've got to redefine good sex. And what we need to be doing, and I'm speaking particularly to leaders here, is we need to speak positively towards sexuality from our pulpits and podiums in our churches. Because what happens, I've asked a lot of different guys, uh, how many times have you heard somebody, how many times have you heard a pastor in a pulpit saying, my wife and I have good sex or something that effect? And most everybody says, I never heard that. What a shame. Then I'll brought another one. How many times have you heard your pastor affirm sexual activity from the pulpit? And many of us have never heard you say that. How many of you have heard your pastor condemn adultery? Oh, lots of times. We've got to speak positively, man. We've got to speak positively. We call people to good. What's the definition of marriage? One man, one woman, husband and wife, for life. We call people to the good. And in doing that, we inevitably express a no for the bad. But if we begin with condemning, then we're what? Condemning and judgmental, and indeed we are. Stop it. Let's call people to good. And in that process, we're going to name wrong. So, how many are for A? How many for A? About half of you. That's pretty good. <laughs> okay. What's that? That's an arrow. Good. Okay. Now, I want you to identify yourself in this arrow. Are you gay, bisexual, or straight? Shall I have some show of hands? Or maybe I should ask you to identify yourself on the spectrum. LGBTQTIA. What is L? Lesbian. Lesbian, that's women. G? Gay, gay that's men. B? Bisexual. Bisexual, means you do both men and women. T? Transgender. Transsexual or transgender. What's the difference? Well, transsexual is somebody who has or is pursuing a surgical procedure. Transgender is how I identify myself. Transsexual is when I start messing with my biology to change my genitalia and hormonal and physical stuff. Uh, Caitlyn Jenner, recent example. Transgender or transsexual? So far, transgender. Transsexual. Well, she is in process. He, she is in process. The Vogue magazine presented her as push-up bra and all that kind of stuff. Very interesting article in the New York Times, shortly after Caitlyn Jenner made the cover of Vogue magazine, was a group of women feminists, strong feminist leaders, outraged, outraged by Caitlyn Jenner. They were saying, correctly, here is another case of men defining what a woman is. And they were angry. In the New York Times, which is hardly to be confused with Christianity today. <laughs> and they're right. They're right. Bruce Jenner is defining what a good woman is. Somebody with showy breasts and who likes to sit around tea and gossip. He is defining and going toward a male definition of female. And they were totally angry. 
I'm probably more angry than they are, one level. But uh, yeah, it's not just Christians who are ticked off by the Caitlyn Jenner nonsense. Well, yes. I'd like to ask if you could say that in, in a different way, but sure. Um, doesn't the, their anger and his expression? Doesn't that just show how confusing everything is? It is very confusing. It is very confusing. I think because, yep. I mean, aren't they being judgmental? Absolutely. Everybody has moral standards. Take the most angry against Christians. You're a bunch of judgmental bigots. What are they? Judgmental, judgmental bigots. bigots. But, but, but the, the problem seems to be prefaced in, the, in this um, feminine jealousy of male supremacy. Is that... I would disagree with that, but I think that's a factor in many cases. But, but that, 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 that doesn't fit into this? No. Oh, it's a factor for some. But, 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 but aren't they saying that they're objecting to a man defining a woman? They are. And, but, 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 but at the same time, they're not accepting the fact that this man is now a woman, or, or is no. on the road to being a woman. They would say she's not. Yeah. I mean, I won't defend non-Christian feminist argumentation is just interesting that they don't like what's happening either. I dislike it for different reasons. I do fundamentally disagree with Caitlyn Jenner's definition of what makes a good woman. Deeply disagree, ironically. Uh, these lesbian, or these uh, feminist leaders also disagree, though probably their definition of what is a good woman would be somewhat different than mine. So just, just one more comment, and I'll sure. be quiet. But probably it's, not, it, but it, go for it. I mean, it, it, it just seems to me that that what you just said about that scenario screams loud and clear that there is no moral canon in our society. That, uh, that, 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 there, that there, there is no boundary, there, there is no, no straight line, and, and, and so who is going to define anything? It, it, it's all confusion. Uh, is there no dividing lines? Uh, there is in our culture. There is. Uh, it's a very interesting phenomenon is that there are certain things that are in the Bible because they're true rather than true because they're in the Bible. Well, that would be, that, that would be the argument that only the, that the Bible is the only source that represents any kind of moral absolutes. Right. Outside of that, it, 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 it's a free-for-all. Yeah, and I would disagree with that. You would disagree with I that? I absolutely do. Yeah, I really do. Uh, what is generally called natural law, there's a lot of writings on natural law. I put this in the of God. I think we are hardwired for justice, marriage, respect of persons, and community, we call it. We're hardwired for that. Everybody knows when they've been treated unjustly. Well, I wouldn't disagree with that, but I would say the Bible it, represents that. It does. But you don't have to have you don't have to know the Bible to believe that injustice is wrong. So it, it's just a way of how you express it. No, I think that somebody can have a genuine standard of, of true morality and not be a Christian in any sense. We just then making an argument that the Christian uh, the Christian worldview is trumps all these other opinions about morality. And uh, what I would say, and again, a lot of people disagree with me on this, uh, is I think there is an image of God level of morality that's hardwired in every human being as the image of God, and it is messed up by depravity in every human being, but it's what I would call undefeatable. We have basic standards of justice that a universe, it's not okay to murder your neighbor in any society. What has that been standardized? Don't murder your neighbor. Well, I, I, I know, but you, you, you can come across cultures that, that would, that would um, well, for example, I think in, in Papua New Guinea, uh, treachery when, when, when was a virtue. I'm talking about murder specifically. But the thing is, don't murder your neighbor. Murder the guy in the next tribe, that's fine. But don't murder your neighbor. But, 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 but natural law is innate. Yes, image of God. That's exactly what I'm saying. It, 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 it's innate, but but, but yes. it's not but, but it's not objectively standardized in such a way so that so that all thinking um, sentential beings can 
can recognize this as a standard that we can that we can operate from. Yeah. Let me just agree with you to a degree. Okay, I'm sorry. That. What I would like to suggest here is if you take this definition, gay, bisexual, straight, uh, there's a better definition. I'm really complex about what the Q was. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't finish. We <laughs> got on a tangent okay. a little bit. What is Q? Queer or questioning? Thank you. But what used to be an insult, your queer has now become gay folk will often talk about themselves as queer or queer rules or something like that. Queer eye for a straight guy kind of stuff. It's it's change. I intersexual. There is a tiny, tiny percentage of people uh, who are born with both male and female genitalia. Tiny. <coughs> like one in 13,000. Uh, and there's a even tinier group that have two, have an X and two Y chromosomes. Or no, two X and a Y. Sorry, I got it wrong there. Two X makes you female, Y makes you male. So there are a few people who are gender ambiguous or sexual ambiguous. Tiny, tiny, tiny minority. But that's, a, that's an issue that's being brought up. Uh, I don't know the XXY numbers, but the ambiguous genitalia at birth is like one in 13,000. You can look up in Wikipedia. Just look at the intersex, and they've got all the statistics there. And the, the, nobody debates those numbers. Though to listen to the discussion, you think intersex is way more common than it is. A means what? Asexual or asexual. They're just not sexual at all. I've not met anybody like that, but I suppose it's possible. I would like to suggest there's a different category, and that's pistis versus pornea. <laughs> What's pistis mean? Faithful or pure. Who's our best pistis guy? Jesus. Okay. Now, question. Was Jesus fulfilled as a human being? Depends on what you mean by fulfilled. Was Jesus fulfilled? Was he... Uh, Fulfilled, personally fulfills a human being. Yeah, I mean, he's the, he's the perfect guy. Did you ever have sexual experience? How do you know? Because Matthew says, or sorry, Hebrews says that he was tempted in all ways, yet without sin. Now, there's a debate whether he wrestled with sexual temptation or not. Some people say no, because he didn't have a sin nature. Other people say, yes, he did have sexual temptation, but overcame it by the power of the Holy Spirit. And, but whichever, he did not have sexual experience of any kind, because that would have been Pernia. Is he a good guy? Say yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so what we're thinking, and my point is, I don't have to have sexual experience to be fulfilled as a human. Though the original command is for people to be married and have good sex. Not sex does not mean you're a bad person. Here, no. Trick question. Trick, 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 trick. Warning, warning, warning. Who's the pistis? Who is pistis in this thing? Can you see it there? So you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Who is pistis here? Trick, 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 question. I am portraying pistis here as a point. And when we think about this, I'm gonna, this will show up here in just a second on your handout. Disciples of Jesus affirm the right and move toward it with God's help. How do I find out what's right and wrong as a, a disciple of Jesus? Scripture. Scripture, as a disciple of Jesus, that's the standard. I affirm the right and I move toward it. My point is, pistis is not a point. Going back to my mathematics days, it is a vector. So it's position, direction of movement, and velocity of movement. Okay, so I gotta put in some vector categories here. Who is pistis? Jesus, yeah, there's a safe answer. <laughs> Among the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And this is a lot harder, isn't it? The guy you start to say seven, what's he doing? 
His head out? Is he pistons? No. How about six? He is one of those Pharisees. He thinks I'm doing fine. Oh my gosh. How about two? Point-wise, he's the furthest away, but he's moving hardest toward it. See, my point is here, we cannot define pistis by where they're currently at. You have to know what direction they're moving and how hard they're moving. We're going to make these kinds of discernments. So, pistis parnea. So, here's my question. Which question is the right question for believers in Jesus Christ? Gabe bisexual straight, L-G-T-I-A, or pistis parnea? B is the right answer. Now, I will tell you, I'm in the definition there, I'm bisexual. Sherry and I have been married. I've been lifelong faithful to Sherry. Pornography has never been a significant issue for me. Is I'm totally repulsed by pornography. I not only don't do it, I hate it because I see the impact it has on men and women. I do everything I can to avoid it, and I can't completely avoid it. Good night. Turn on the TV. Watch the Super Bowl, and what are you assaulted by? Victoria's Secret commercials. Yikes. So don't watch the Super Bowl. That's the solution. <laughs> Is Oregon going to win tonight? <laughs> don't watch it because you'll see Victoria's Secret commercials. <laughs> <coughs> we should define ourselves as, my definition is Son of the Lord Most High. My definition is accepted in Jesus Christ. My fundamental definition is there, not the fact that I'm a happily married man. Though that's true. My fundamental definition is I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. Because if I found out that Sherry had a heart attack and died in her bed before I get home tomorrow, which would break my heart big time, my identity would not change. My marital status would change, and my sexual fulfillment would change majorly. But my identity would not change. My real identity. And we've got to define our identity properly. Don't let yourself be suckered off into I'm a gay, straight, bisexual. Because at that point, I'm giving credence to the fact that gay is a legitimate definition. I love it. Comments, questions? That's a, that's a big That's a big issue. Because uh, in the current collegiate culture, the son and the DA, yep. and as a Christian dealing with this, with the gay item, yep. um, it's really about the, the struggle of that I am homosexual tendencies, right. but I may not be fulfilling them, but that is still part of my character. So That's correct. Right. <clears throat> yes, so I'm my... saying that would fit into that. Yes. Perspective there, you may struggle with that tendency. Yes. But yet you can move towards. That's correct. I can. Let me just ask you this: How many have jacked up sexual desires? How many have jacked up sexual desires? One time. <laughs> One time. <laughs> I am astounded that anybody didn't stick your hand up. <laughs> of course, you have jacked up sexual desires. Now, I won't ask for hands, but in a group of men this large, I would absolutely guarantee there's somebody who wrestles with same-sex stuff at some level. And the statistics, assuming you're a representative sample, it's beyond doubt that somebody wrestles with same-sex issues. Does that make you a particularly bad person? The answer is no, not at all. Not at all. That's a piece of who you are in your character. It's not your fundamental definition that I'm suggesting. But it is a factor. We all have jacked up sexual desires. Some of you have jacked up same-sex desires. Okay, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Let's find God's help to deal with your jacked up sexual desires. Whatever. That's my thing. Compassion, again, as John said so well this morning. And the compulsion to bring gospel into the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I have a question. Uh, question. Imagine yeah, that.
an Anglican Episcopal. In the United States, Anglicans are faithful to biblical standards in this area. Episcopalians are not. Very real question. And what we're going to see happening, we've already seen it. Ryan Meeks and East Lake Fellowship up in Bellevue, Washington, large. Uh, Ryan Meeks was a speaker catalyst, for example. Back in January, I think it was, he came out and said, We're, we're gay affirming. Uh, did it in the most emotionally manipulative sermon I've ever heard. You can go hear it online. Uh, this summer, June, maybe, I'm not sure when, City Church in the heart of San Francisco, which is a kind of a Redeemers New York authorized plant, uh, again, strong, widely observed evangelical church, again, done quietly announced that we're now gay affirming. We will accept uh, gay married folk at every level and we'll do gay marriages at our part of our service. Uh, Pearl Church in Portland just did this just like three or four weeks ago. Again, long-term uh, good evangelical church in downtown Portland, Pearl District, just announced like three weeks ago that they will now be open to married uh, lesbians and gays and do gay weddings as a part of the church ministry. You'll see more of that. Uh, my involvement here is when somebody does that, uh, we have not parted ways. Uh, in the same sense, I mean, I could look at other kinds of things like that where you denied something that is fundamental to the Christian affirmation, and marriage is. Uh, so, so would you not like, like the seven three aspects? I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to do it. I don't know Is that where you draw? I would, yeah, I would say, I would say, uh, with broken heart, because I know Michael, I mean, he's not a close friend, but we've done some stuff together, some very, very challenging ministry stuff together, and I know a lot of leadership there. The whole preaching team is now left, and some of the preaching team are very close friends. They all left. They said, we can't affirm this. It's, uh, now, who knows what happened in the church, I don't know. But no, I'd say that, you know, we can't do seven together. I can't pray God's blessing when you're at, you're affirming and leading something that's fundamentally sinful. Now it's a personal decision, but and I don't know what seven will do. I don't have any idea. Yeah. Uh, it you know can we serve together cleaning up the park? There there'd be a level at which I would let a Mormon. I would work with a Mormon. I would work with them at the same level, perhaps. But I and say it's a complicated discussion. But yeah, we just parted ways. We cannot walk together. And I don't think I'm being judgmental. That's really deep identity to what we're at. Yeah. Did all the preaching staff left, who burned and drove this decision? Mike Roth and two people on the, I don't know what they call their leadership team. Pardon? What is his role? He's senior pastor. Okay, so everybody but the senior pastor. Yeah, on the preaching team. There were, and I don't know who, I don't know names, but on the, what do they call their leadership committee? Mike and two people from that leadership committee made the decision and announced it to the rest of the church. And ironically, and I'm angry at what Mike did, if you can't tell that, on their website they say we're a community where we talk about everything. One of the key values of Pearl Church is we talk about everything, except the decision to become the affirmative. Oh my gosh. I mean, I'm ticked. I'm not a part of the church. And People are part of the church are more ticked than I am. Because I feel a violation of what Mike has done. And I'll name it publicly because they've gone very public in what they're doing. I, I like Mike. I've never, I haven't had a chance to sit down and talk with him, but some other people have. And he's not open to change. He totally believes that. Do you look back at your relationship with him over the years? Do you see the seeds of this? No, I don't. I, Mike's stuff caught us all but completely by surprise. We did not see that. Uh, Mike is certainly not a fundamentalist, but uh, yeah, we didn't, we didn't see it. Uh, Dave Wallace, Reality San Francisco, is a student and close friend. He he was taught 
holding up art by Fred's decision at City Church. It just, and they're, I mean, they're really close. Yeah, so it's, you know, Ryan Meeks was not so surprising because he'd been playing the left for a while. Yeah, it's tough. What about the Catholic Church? The Catholic Church, in any foreseeable future, remain completely faithless as a church. Individual Catholics, of course, are gay Catholics like they're gay evangelicals, but the church is not going to change on this. People are saying, oh, Pope Francis is okay with homosexuality. No, he's not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's not coming out and having the judgmental, condemning attitude so much, but yeah, he's, he's not going to back down. Can we go back to the identity? Can we go back to the identity? Yes. Uh, so, so, if you have a conversation with somebody, their identity is the self-traffic and their sexuality and their sexuality. How do you steer them to away from that towards something that's seeing themselves in the identity that's more than just Yeah. yeah. How do you steer somebody away from sexuality to send their identity? Yeah. To toward a uh, child of God. I, I would do this in lots of different areas. I, I'm, I'm going to talk about somebody who's heterosexual and happily married. If they see their identity, hey, I'm a happily married man, I say, dude, like, let's think. What you're telling me is you've lost your identity if your wife dies. And I'm going to call them biblically back to a deeper gospel-centered identity because if I, if we and we could just parody what Jared said this morning. If I make my marriage, my sexual activity or such in my marriage, if I make that central, that's become an idol in my life. And it won't sustain the weight. It will crash. I've got a God at the center. And if I don't, it's going to crash. God is the only one that can be God. So without that, this is something that Anything I put at the center of my identity, other than child of the Lord Most High, can't bear the weight of being God. And you know, Tim Keller is really good on um, counterfeit gods, and many sex power. If you put your job there, it will crash. It can't bear the weight. Not a not a bad thing at all to be a happily married man. I are one. But if that's the center of my identity, it can't bear the weight. It will crash. I've got to get back to a deeper gospel identity. That's what Jeremy's meeting is in and doing a great job on. Uh, important, I think. All humans bear what? How many? All. Jesus commands us to what? Good. Okay, you're doing great. What does love mean? Sentence one. I love pizza. Sentence two. I love my enemy. Those two mean the same thing in standard American? Nope. What does love mean in I love pizza? It means I desire it for my own pleasure and fulfillment. Here, where we're at right now at Roundup, I could say I love steak. Because <laughs> that desire is going to be fulfilled in ridiculous quantity <laughs> and soon. <laughs> somebody want a third? Oops, I'd like a third of somebody's steak here. <laughs> but see, what happens is we take this definition of love, I desire for my own pleasure and fulfillment, and bring that into our marriage. I've heard many men, and especially men, say, I love my wife, and they mean definition A. They should say, love in the second sense, I seek to preserve their dignity and welfare even at personal cost. That's what love your life means. And what happens is we misdefine love as 
I desire it for my own pleasure and fulfillment, and we say I love my wife and we need definition A, and we inevitably end up abusing our wife when we do Inevitably. <coughs> we don't even recognize it. We say, man, I love my wife. That's not love. What is it? What's definition A? It's not love. What is it? Self. Lust. Lust. And you say, I love my wife for my own pleasure and fulfillment. You're, so what you should say is, I lust my wife. Now, there's a sense in which that's fine. As long as you also say, I seek to preserve her dignity and welfare, even at personal cost. Because lusting for your wife, desiring her for your pleasure and fulfillment, is legit. As long as that's lower than, I seek her dignity and welfare, even at personal cost. So this question should be, leave any room for modification at all? Or is that you cannot modify my handout. You cannot <laughs> modify my handout. What are you doing, you evil person? <laughs> of course no, you can modify it. Years ago, um, back in 7, Scott Peck wrote Luke in July. Yep. In his definition of love, he said it was a willingness to extend yourself to the spiritual welfare of another person. Okay. Which still, yep. to me, yep. is the Scott best. Peck, People of the Lie, it's a... Fabulous, challenging book I require my students to read part of it. Uh, and he defines love in a way that's very similar to this. I extend myself for the spiritual welfare of another person. That's a variation of the same definition. Yeah. The risk of sounding self-righteous, sometimes when I'm dialoguing on Facebook, that's the intent of our heart. Oh, yeah. Is it okay to love in the sense of getting self-fulfillment from it? Is it okay if I love somebody and am fulfilled by that love? Absolutely. This idea that God's love is self-sacrificial in the sense that he gets no pleasure from what he's doing? Ridiculous. Read Hebrews 12. Why did Jesus go through this enduring the shame of the cross? For the joy set before him. Of course there's a fulfillment in love. Very legitimate. You just don't always get it. But if you do, all the better. This is where I stand with John Piper in desiring God and Christian hedonism. I fulfill the deepest desires of my heart when I serve God. There's a delight. Yeah, that was great. Absolutely. Can you repeat questions when you're identifying? Yeah, I'm trying to repeat questions for the video as well. What did I not repeat? Whatever, yeah. <laughs> So, and I think this is important, and our time is out, so I'm going to have to quit here. I think this is really important, and Jeremy was saying it this morning. Christians preserve and protect the respect and dignity of all people. Do I love my gay co-worker? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Well, I actually hate the sin, not the sinner doesn't work, because sinners sin. And we're so, sinners. what? We're all sinners, we're all sinners as well. Yeah, it's really true. Yeah, I'm tempted to go with that, but I don't know. We're all sinners in needs of God's grace and cleansing. Distinguish attraction from activity. Super, super important. Won't be allowed. But really, 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 really important to separate those two. We all got jacked up sexual attraction. That doesn't mean we have jacked up sexual activity. And we can shepherd our sexual activities to a large degree. Uh, I think we can shepherd all of our activities toward godliness with the Spirit's help and the help of the community. Anyway, we need to quit because we've got another great workshop coming up. Let me pray and we'll finish. Lord, we have explored this very complex issue. Uh, just at some fundamental levels, but will you fill our hearts with compassion for sinners, but also a heart that brings gospel into the conversation in a positive way. And in those places when we are reviled, we will be, may we be like you, Lord Jesus, and revile not again, or respond with service and with compassion, but also with a demonstrated righteousness by the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. At those steps where we're not righteous, and Lord, those are there, I'm sorry to say. Give us the power of the Spirit and the humility that comes with that to say, I need to learn to go and be a disciple of Jesus Christ to the fullest. So I pray a blessing for these good men in Jesus' name.
Thank you all.